All right, well, today we're back to work on the C6 Competition Drift Car Build. Uh, last episode, we got a ton of stuff done, and pretty much all of the big question marks that I had burning on my mind, making me lose sleep at night, wondering how we were going to do them, how they were going to pan out, if we were going to be able to do it with the parts we had, if we are going to need more parts, which is the latest. We got all of that done. We got the turbo system completely built. We got a double slip joint and our merge collector. We got our cold side intercooler piping done to then allow us to run a five inch intake. So huge, huge to have that stuff off the checklist. We are so close to getting to the point where we just need to do, you know, lines and fittings, plumbing and wiring. So we also started on our fuel system. We got our deep trucks and tank surge tank set up and our fuel cells. So this has all our pumps and an internal surge tank. So very nice, very simple setup. So we need to start working on the other end of the fuel system. We've got a smorgasbord of projects to work on today, but where we're going to start is with getting the fuel pressure regulator mounted because we got our rails in. I, I lost the spacers for my fuel rails and luckily Borowski was nice enough to send me a replacement set. Um, they also sent us Oh, the little throttle cable bracket they made that threads into the started boss on the intake. That was something we were also trying to figure out. So that's pretty much sorted. All we got to do is get the right throttle cable. Um, we've got the fittings in the rails. We did discover a problem with this one. This is why sometimes things take a long time. You think, ah, we're good to go. And then you go to put it together and you realize, oh snap, we need a different fitting. So we'll be able to get a fitting that works for there. But yeah, now we need to get the regulator mounted. So we've got our Deechworks regulator. We're gonna be dual feeding this regulator. So we're gonna dual feed the rails, dual feed the regulator. Instead of doing the traditional LS style where we would come in one rail, cross over to the other rail, go down that rail and out. Since this car is gonna demand a lot of fuel and make a lot of power and fueling is very important, we're gonna split the feed into two lines and feed both rails at the same time, come out of both rails into the regulator. Now that makes mounting the regulator a little bit trickier than it would be normally. So that's something we really want to get crossed off the list because then we pretty much have everything in the fuel system in place and we can start running our lines. We also need to get our rice sensor blocks mounted because these we're going to go where we're probably going to have to put that. So if we've got to find a good compromise to where we can fit all of these in the right places to where everything's happy and everything reaches. So a whole lot of jibber jabber to say. We need to get to work. Once we get this figured out, we can start diving into uh, wastegate dumps and th there's a lot to do. I'm not even gonna try to guess what we're gonna get into. We're just gonna try to get as much work done as possible. So enough jibber jabber, let's get to it. So we figured out we want to feed the rails from the front with these 150s. These Dietrich swings are really cool because they're super high flow, real gradual long bends, which we're going to need because we're going to be using all that 10 AN. We decided we're going to switch to 8 AN for the return. The 10 AN is so much larger and we don't need it for the return. We're running an 8 AN return anyway. So for these two lines, we'll just run dual 8 AN into the regulator and then 8 AN out. <sighs> So that's the plan, but that means we got to order a couple more fittings to uh, do this how we want it. That's the tough thing about AN lines and fittings. Even with stuff in place, man, it is hard to tell for sure how it's all going to pan out until you take the fittings and put them in there. Jibber jabber, but that looks really good. It's going to clean things up a lot. I didn't want to have lines zigzagging back and forth around. Sandy came out to uh, give us some advice. What do you think, Sands? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Well, we thought about that. Yeah. We weren't going to do it without checking. Whoa, she said the tires are too small. We know those aren't the ones we're gonna run, Sandy. Yeah. All right, we've got a merge figured out. Before I order the last couple fittings I need, I need to order the lines to feed the sensors. So what I wanna do now is I wanna get the sensor block mounted. Are we committing, Josue? Are we committing to regulator low? It's funny, on a project like this, when you spend so much time trying to plan out every single thing and where you're going to put it and what the compromises are, 
it, it, the longer you go on wondering and, and trying out different places, the harder it gets to commit to a location. And sometimes you just got to say, you know what, let's put it there. Worst case, we'll redo it later. So it's so he goes out and drills the holes. I put the M4 rib nuts in. So I've actually had these M4 rib nuts for a while and I just never had bolts for them. But knowing we we're going to have to mount a bunch of electronics, finally ordered the bolts and man, they worked out just perfect for this. Quarter inch ratchet hose sway on the double. Is it going the correct way? I, yes, sir. Wow. Excellent observation. Look at that. Beautiful, one sensor block mounted. Nice. All right, now we need to put the fittings in it and uh, start kind of round lines and see where they need to go. So the way these sensor blocks work is they're remote mounting the sensors. So we need to run lines between whatever it is we're trying to monitor and the sensor block. Now this is uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's gonna simplify our wiring a lot. We're gonna wire a six pin connector to this block as opposed to wiring three pin connectors to each one of the sensors. Thing two, remote mounting the sensors, one, keeps them away from temperature, keeps them better isolated from heat, but two, it keeps them much better isolated from engine vibration. And that's a big thing you see with LS oil pressure sensors. A lot of people end up remote mounting them because the vibrations just absolutely demolish them. So it seems maybe a little silly to have to run lines to your sensors, but it's, it's the best way to keep your sensors safe and out of harm's way. And it's a much cleaner setup in terms of wiring. So I think it's the best way to do it if you're gonna be running multiple external sensors. Not to mention these rice sensors are super, super accurate and incredibly reliable. It's completely modular and interchangeable. I just, I think it's such a cool setup. I nerd out on it a little bit. And uh, I've been excited to mount these and figure out exactly where we wanted to put them. Now there's some compromises between where the, the sensors need to go and where it needs to go. And you know, it's not necessarily the perfect place, but it's the place it needs to go. Look at that, mounted. Things are being mounted. So we decided to mount it here because uh, our back pressure that needs to come off this merge going into the turbo here. So it can't be, it couldn't be too far away. We've got to run like a hard copper line swirled up through a, a basically a muffler damper and then to this. So we were kind of limited on where we could mount it, but it honestly works out there. And it's mostly away from the heat besides the wastegate. I, I think it'll be all right, hopefully. If not, we got two rib nuts for something else. But uh, basically we're gonna be monitoring back pressure in the exhaust system. And the reason for that is, you know, I used to think when I was younger, like, oh, why wouldn't you just put like a T25 on an LS and then it'd spool like lightning fast. But the problem is if you go too small on the turbo, then the engine can't breathe. You've got to imagine the exhaust is going through the turbo. So the smaller you make the turbo, the harder the time the engine has getting the exhaust out. That's why it was hard for us to size this turbo because this being a big old 427, it's gonna create a lot of exhaust gas. So you get to this point where as you add boost, you add back pressure, which is just pressure in the exhaust system. So since we'll be able to monitor that, we'll be able to see like that point where, okay, you know, if we add a couple pounds of boost, the back pressure is going way up and try, just try to find the, the happy point where the engine makes the most power, um, but can still breathe and isn't being choked out by the turbo because that's when just everything gets hot and everything gets unhappy. So we got that, that's what this is gonna be monitoring. The second one is gonna be monitoring our crankcase pressure and vacuum. So it's gonna go to this port right here and uh, that's gonna allow us to see how much vacuum the dry sump is pulling and we can adjust this regulator to set a, a specified amount of vacuum. And we can see if we have any positive pressure and we'll be able to monitor that. And like, let's say it never goes into positive pressure, then all of a sudden we're getting 10 pounds of positive crankcase pressure. We know we probably got a problem. We're getting a lot more boost past the ring. So it'll be good to have all this information. So yeah, both our sensor blocks are mounted. Really happy with that. We had to order two lines for oil pressure and fuel pressure. Uh, we got a line that'll work for MAP, and then we got to order the stuff to do the back pressure. It's a whole contraption to like a resonator to dampen the, the pulses. It's kind of crazy. So happy to have those mounted. So I wanted to get as many of the lines in as we had. So that nobody makes a 12 ORB to 8 MPT fitting, so we made our own. Boom. Crankcase pressure and vacuum. It looks good with that low pro fitting. Look at that. And we keep the line away from heat. Solid. Super easy to pop it off, but we take the valve covers off. Should be sealed nice. A1. So it pretty much wraps us up with the sensor box for right now. So I think the next thing I wanna tackle 
is our wastegate dump tube. So before we could start mocking up our wastegate dump tubes, we needed to get the hood back on. To get the hood back on, we have to get the fender arches back on because that's where the hood mount is. So we had to chop a little bit out of this one just to make it a little bit easier to install and remove around our dry sump vent tank since we put that behind the main dry sump tank. It was just, it was a little tight with that little piece there. So we got that done. Both fender arches are back in. So we have the rear hood pin support. Now we need to put the front hood pin supports in. So these bolt to the bash bar. So we need to get those in again to get the hood on and the reason i want to get the hood on is because i want to see kind of where the best place to punch these out is the wastegates are in very different spots so we need to kind of know where the hood's going to be what kind of jigs and jogs we can do to try to make these as even as possible so with the hood back on doing a little measuring a little bit of looking we now have a good idea so we need to get the hood back off and get our wastegate fire rings in so the fire ring is essentially what seals the the piston if you want to call it that of the wastegate which is what's holding your exhaust gas in and then when it opens, letting it out. So these also center the wastegates on the flanges. And since this is all gonna be pretty precise to get these out of the exact size hole, that matches the pipe and no big gaps. We needed to make sure those were in first so the wastegates were exactly where they needed to be. All right, wastegate fire rings are installed. We got our flanges in. What we're gonna try to do here is somewhat match where these come out. So this one obviously has to 90. This one, we can have it right here. It doesn't have to do anything. We're gonna try to keep this one as far this way as possible. Obviously we wanna keep them away from the intake. So yeah, we'll see. We're just gonna start cutting some pieces. Well, Sway is gonna start on the fuel lines. It's crazy. This is one of the really nice things about PTFE line is it is so much smaller. This is 10 AN line and it's like the size of 6AN rubber AN hose. So I don't know what his plan is, but I'm gonna let him figure it out. And I'm gonna start chopping these Mishimoto 1.75 inch stainless tubes up. See what we can come up with. So after a little bit of tinkering, we decided to go ahead and make our first cut. Now this is one of those fab projects where you kind of just have to start cutting stuff and looking at it and cutting stuff and looking at it. There's not a great way to just measure and say, this is the angle we need, this is the length we need. Here we go. It's easier to just kind of make some cuts and see where things need to go, especially because these gates are in such different places and we need to try to make them match as best we can. One, under the hood, but two, obviously, as they come out of the hood. We don't want them in drastically different places. So after looking at it some more, we realize we need a little bit more angle and we're starting to cut into the bend a little bit at this point, but since we're welding to a flange, uh, we can get away with that. So while that was going on, Josue went ahead and made a couple of the fuel lines, the main two, into the rails. So I went ahead and helped him get those in and get the Y connected so we could start working on the main fuel line back to the tank. So once that was all sorted and he was back to work on that, I decided to go ahead and commit and weld this tube to this flange because this was going to be the harder one. This was the most difficult one to get good clearance to. So I wanted to go ahead and just tack this one and build the other one off of it. So we just threw two tacks on this because we weren't sure if we were going to commit to it. And we, we wanted the option to turn back and not waste these flanges. But we got it tacked. We went ahead and threw it back on the car. And now it's time to try to make this second one and make it match the first one. So this one needs a lot less angle because of the angle the wastegate's at. Again, they're in very different locations, height-wise, angle-wise, everything. They, they really couldn't be much more different. So we make our cut, we go ahead and clean it off prematurely because we hadn't tested it yet and it's not quite the right angle. So looking at it some more, I decided, you know what, I don't wanna deal with cutting a little piece and then having another weld. We're just gonna start fresh with another piece. There's no reason to have two welds on one of these if we can get away with it and just have one weld at the flange. So the next cut's closer, not quite there. So we switch to a more aggressive belt and grind in a little bit more angle. This belt eats on that belt grinder, man. It'll blow through some material quick. So we get it to the point where we're pretty happy with it. We spend a bunch of time looking at it. It's hard to tell for sure how it's gonna land going through the hood, but uh, it's close enough for us. I think it's the best we've got it. So it's time to go ahead and tack this one up, get it back on with the other one, figure out how to best match them so then we can start working on punching them through the hood. So we left them long so that we had a little leeway there to do that. All right, I've got the wastegate dumps matched up about as well as I could with how different their positions are. They're pretty, close pretty it's it's like every angle i look at it's slightly different they should be a little bit closer when we chop them by the hood so so you got the lines done so you can see both go under the intake and then back here to a y oh that is a little tight for that next line but yeah so that looks sweet i'm really really pleased we we're able to do it this way well, we originally wanted to put the regulator on the front of the motor but then i switched to this water outlet 
so there was nowhere to put it. I mean, I guess we could have maybe, t yeah, there's basically nowhere to put it. Uh, so I was like, I really don't want to have, you know, 180s coming out and going back to the regulator. So that's why we decided to flip it. So I'm happy with that. So far, so good. Very clean looking. One more step forward. Now we got to build, start there and just a straight line all the way back to the filter housing here into the fuel hat. Anyway, I'm going to try to figure out what I want to do here. I don't think I want them poking through the hood. So probably just match the hood angle. So to get this right, it requires a lot of uh, steps forward and steps back. So we basically took the wastegate tubes off put the hood back on, found a reference point, and measured from there to the hood to have an idea of how long they're gonna need to be. We then took the hood back off, put the tubes back in, that way we could measure from that same reference point, mark them, you know, roughly an inch longer. And the idea is we'll cut them and then set the hood down pretty close to landing then we can mark the hole. If we set the hood down on top of them this long, especially since they're angled, it's not gonna be anywhere near where the hole needs to be when they're cut shorter. So that was the first step, to get them cut short enough to then mark the hood. So we go ahead, mark both of them. We cut them just roughly. We know we've got a little, about an inch in hand to cut these and get the, the angle just right to match the hood and all of that nonsense. So with that done, we put them back in and I noticed that the uh, passenger side one's a little bit taller and I realized I may have made a mistake on my cutting. And I did, I, I measured from the wrong reference point on the driver's side one, but we get them mashed up as best we can. It's close enough, tall enough to get me an idea of where the hole needs to go through the hood. So we put the hood back on, make sure it snaps into place fully exactly where it needs to be, and then mark the holes. So this is the easiest way to do it for me to get the holes in the exact spot because we just marked around the pipe since the pipe was sitting flush against the hood, pulled the hood off. Luckily, I had the exact size hole saw I needed. I only have like three hole saws and I had a two inch and this is 1.75 inch pipe. So worked out pretty well. We got the passenger side good, but obviously the driver's side is too short. Now, we could extend this. This would be the easiest way to do it. We could just throw an extension on it, but that's, that's not the way I like to roll, right? The other one doesn't have any secondary welds on it. I'm not gonna do it to this one. We've got enough material. So we go through the fun process of cutting the tacks off, which is why we only did two tacks and then making a new piece. Now we knew the angle was right. We had the angle correct. We just needed to make it a little longer. So it was pretty easy. Just cut another piece to the same angle. Don't cut it too short, get it tacked together, and then put it back in. And since we already have the hole through the hood, we can punch it through the hood and then mark it and go ahead and make our final cut. And that's what we did on the other side, which was long enough. We have that inch in hand and with it poking through the hood, we were able to mark around the hood, not only to get the length, but to get the angle to match the hood. So the idea here is just to have them come up flush with the hood and match the angle. So we've got them both where we're happy with them. We've got them in their final position where they need to be. So we go ahead and weld them out. It was a little tricky to back purge just because I didn't have quite the right size plug to go in the bottom of the wastegate and it kept wanting to fall out. And you don't want it to fall out while you're mid weld because then that defeats the purpose. If you lose argon coverage on the inside, then it's not gonna do anything for you. So it's a little tricky, a little bit of a fight trying to keep this plug in, but we got them both welded. We used the wastegate itself as a big heat sink basically. Um, but you can see the difference in length and, and angle and everything from where these two are mounted. So with that done, all the taking apart, putting together, putting to part, taking together, it's time to put it back together for the quote unquote final time and put the hood in and see how it all lines up. So we left them loose, got them to where we were happy with them in the hole and then got everything tightened up. All right, the holes actually turned out pretty dang close. This one's solid. This one I ended up rebuilding, but got it back in the hole. Now, in hindsight, it bugs me more. I think it bugs me more that they're cl so close, but yet a little bit off. This one, this hole's about a half inch higher. In hindsight, I should have angled this one more and matched the holes on the hood, but I was more worried about matching the angle of the pipes aesthetically in the engine bay. I, I care more about what it looks like with the hood off than the hood on. But now looking at it with the hood on, it's like, there's so little to look at, you notice it more than you would notice the angle difference with the hood off. So, you know, one of those things. But overall, I'm happy with it. I was going to do the teardrops, but I don't know. I'm kind of over it. I haven't even done that many teardrops, and I'm over it. I kind of prefer this look. Just the clean, flush hole. You know, I don't want to make a big production out of my wastegates coming out of the hood. That's just the most efficient, and easiest place to run them. So, all right, we can take this hood back off because we got our Dietchworks 8AN stuff. They got this stuff to me super quick. 
So this is what we're gonna run to the regulator. I'm still waiting on the fittings for the rails, the back of the rails, the 90 degree Earl's fittings that I ordered, but we can at least get the regulator mocked up in there. All right, I think that's gonna work. We're gonna have to make a little bracket to space it off the firewall there, but I think that's gonna work. I'll leave that for Osway when he gets here. We need to look at the list. We're at that point of the build where it's like, you're kind of bouncing around between things. So, wastegate dumps are done. Uh, plumbing fuel system, we're working on that. Modify radiator, don't really need that. Paint sheet metal. I wanted to do the body mount electric power steering, done. Wire engine, wire car, body panel mounts, paint sheet metal, that we're gonna do later once everything is off. Uh, might hold off on modifying the rad, lines, 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 firewall plates and pass-throughs, that, wow. Okay, this is kind of where I thought we were. So there are two fab projects left to do. I need to mount the dash, I need to build stanchions off. I'm probably gonna do quick latches so it's super easy to remove and get it out of the way, but we need to do some more fitting. We do need to finish closing up our rear firewall and I need to make rear body panel mounts. However, I ordered rear wide body fenders. I think we can hold off on that and that means it's plumbing and wiring time, which is crazy. It's like, if you ever built a car, when you get, at least for me, when I get to the first startup, I always feel like I'm not there. I'm like, is it really? Is that, like, is it really just ready? Is that all that's left? And same with when I get a car done and running and driving. The whole time I'm driving it around in my head, it's not done yet. You know, it, it takes me a minute. So anyway, so yeah, I think, uh, I think I'm gonna dive into wiring. Let Josue continue with plumbing the fuel system. Once he's done with that, we can start working on the dry sump line. We still need to mount the oil cooler, which should be here in a day or so. So we do need to mount that to then plumb the oil feed out of the pump through the oil cooler, through the filter into the engine. We can start working on the coolant lines, yeah. So. I think we're just gonna dive right into it, man. I think it's finally time. Let's start, uh, let's start trying to mount some electronics. Let me show you what we got for electronics in the first place. All right, so here are all <laughs> of our electronics. So we got all of this on Holly's website. Uh, Raceback is included in that. So we're using all Holly electronics, which is gonna be really convenient because we'll be able to integrate everything very easily. So let me get this stuff unboxed. It doesn't look very cool sitting in boxes and uh, show you what we've got to go in this car. It's a lot. There's a lot of electronics involved. You know what? This is gonna be a satisfying one. Let's do, let's do old Snapperuski. All right, so here is what we've got for electronics. Starting with the main, main business, we have a Holly Dominator you see here. These things are absolute monsters. They're metal case, fully potted on the inside. These things are super beefy. So I've always run the Holly Terminator, which is the lower level ECU because Pretty much every build I've done, it's done everything I need it to do. It's never ran out of capabilities. Uh, where the Dominator comes in is it has, there's a bunch of things, but one of the biggest things for us is it has a lot more inputs and outputs. So we are gonna be able to run as many sensors as we want. So, I mean, we could go as far as shock level sensors, tire temperature sensors, you know, all sorts of data collection because it has a gajillion, really an endless amount of inputs and outputs. Now we'll also be able to use it to turn certain things on and do all sorts of cool stuff like, you know, our third feed pump and our surge tank. We shouldn't need that for any bit of regular running, but we could have it set up through this as a fail safe of if there's a lean condition and the duty cycle's maxed out or if the fuel pressure drops, etc. So basically have an automatic fail safe fuel pump. So uh, that's what's really cool. This will give us pretty much endless capabilities as far as we want to go with this car. I'm excited. I've always wanted a Dominator just because they're cool, and uh, but I've just never been able to justify it because the Terminator's always been plenty. Uh, so paired with this, we have their Pro Dash. So I have this same dash in the truck. I absolutely love it. Uh, we have a mount for it to go on the column. This is a really, really nice dash. And the cool thing is with the Dominator, we can actually tune from our digital dash we can make tune changes, which is super cool. You know, if I just wanted to make a quick tune change while I'm in grid, it, maybe I'll never do it, but it sounds pretty cool. I'd, I'd love to be able to do that. So we have that, we have their engine harness. I was gonna build my own and I, I still want to, but we're running out of time here and building an engine harness correctly takes a lot of time. So we're probably just gonna run theirs. We also have 
These are auxiliary harnesses for our inputs and outputs. We also have two race pack smart wires. So these are PDMs, power distribution modules. So this is going to eliminate all our fuses and relays. This is all solid state. And I run a PDM on the Miata and I could never go back for race car stuff. It is so convenient. It's so easy to do stuff. You can do so much cool stuff with the wiring and the software aspect of it. So the reason we have two, one is for the Miata. I wanna replace the one I have in the Miata with, a, with one of these. I like these a lot better. Uh, however, we might actually need two for this car. We do have a lot of stuff that needs to get powered. We've got four fuel pumps. We've got two fans electric water pump, power steering pump, all the engine and ignition stuff. We're gonna have probably interior lights and headlights and tail lights. We might be able to get away with one. We really need to map it out to figure that out. So that's what we're gonna do. We need to start planning where we wanna put all this stuff. And then I need to start mapping out my wiring harness for the chassis and figure out if we're gonna need one or two. But first I wanna start, I just wanna, you know, get fancy new stuff, you wanna play with it. So I wanna start mapping out where we're gonna put these. Well, we were cruising along the fuel lines, but unfortunately, the last fitting, it's always the last fitting, uh, got messed up when Josue was putting it together. He got some braid caught in the threads and it just ate up the threads. So we're gonna have to put a hold on the fuel line. Once we get that fitting in, we should be able to nail out the rest of the fuel system. Now, in the meantime, we've got our wiring situation pretty well sorted out. We should definitely only need one smart wire. Fortunately, one of the things I really like about the Race Pack smart wire is they give you a ton of inputs and outputs. Let's mount this thing up. Let's just commit to it. One electronic mounted. With that mounted, I wanna decide where we're gonna put the keypad. Now, I originally was gonna just put it on the dash, but I do like the idea of having it down here. Super close and easy to get to when you're fully tightened in and the straps could make a little box for it, little mount box deal for it, bada boom, right there. Uh, so I wanna sit down in the driver's seat and see what that feels like. Uh, but that would be good because the PDM's right here, so it's just a super short run to get to it. Not that it matters, but just keeps things simple, keeps things together. Now, you might be asking why we mounted this back here. Now, most of the time I mount the electronics up here, but that's because most of my heavy draw stuff's in the front, the radiator, all that stuff. However, on this car, we don't have much. Really, the only thing we have in the front that draws a lot of current is the ignition coils and the injectors. Other than that, really, everything up there is mechanical. All of our heavy draw stuff is back here. So we've got four fuel pumps, our two fans, and our electric water pump are all back here. So now we have a super short run to get to all of those things. We're going from right there to right there or there. Not to mention we're gonna mount our batteries in this pocket in here. So now we have a super short run from the battery to the PDM, from the PDM to all the heavy current stuff. So the only thing we might run on it, the cool shirt will be mounted up there. Um, but that's even still a pretty close run. So that's why I decided to put it back there, nice and accessible too. Uh, even with the passenger seat, we shouldn't have any problems getting to that. We got everything laid out here. We have our solid state battery isolator. So these are pretty cool. They're solid state like our PDM is. Um, and this is going to be our kill switch, our battery isolator. So one, instead of having to route battery cables to an external area to be legal for most series rules so that the way there's an external switch all we have to do is route these two little wires to this switch and that's going to be our external kill switch and this is going to be our internal on off switch so turning this on will one ground the battery two send power out to the pdm wiring which will turn the pdm on which will then turn the ecu on and all the other stuff 
So we got that, we got our CAN controller, we got our digital dash. Uh, so what we want, what I want to do first before we start trying to map anything out is I want to just get everything mounted. First and foremost is to get the ECU mounted, which I'll sway starting on with our Motion Raceworks roll cage bracket. Like I said, we have the wrong size ones of these, but we'll just use some tape or something for now to get it where it needs to be and I'll order the right ones. Um, We've got our digital dash mount, but I want to make uh, the button pad mount. So let's see what we can come up with. So one of the tricky things about working on different projects is you're kind of set up and equipped to do a certain thing. We're set up and equipped to do wiring and plumbing, not fab work. You don't want to be doing a bunch of fab work on top of all your wiring and plumbing. Uh, but we needed to get this done. We needed to make this box. So. I wanted to use a scrap piece. Now the piece is a little on the small side, but I didn't want to have to pull a big sheet out, clamp to the table, cut it. It just would have been a whole production. So we used the scrap piece, we cut it out, we cleaned it up on the belt grinder as per usual. And then we used the template that race pack supplies with the keypad to mark our holes. We got it clamped up, drilled our mounting holes, made sure those were gonna work, got them a little bit oversized. And then it was time to drill the main hole. Now, luckily, again, I have just the right size hole saw bit for this, since there needs to be a relief for the, the spot on the keypad where the wiring plugs in. So we got that hole cut out, tried to oversize it a little bit because it was on the tight side. So I was just working it around in circles and what do you know, fits perfect. We were able to put the keypad in there so that we could perfectly mark our bin line since again, this piece is on the small side and then we went ahead and cleaned up the little bit of slag and burrs from drilling the holes. Now, we put this in the press brake. The problem is we need to go to about 120, 130 degrees and the press brake only goes to 90. So we got most of the way there with the press brake, nice clean bend, but we had to do a little bit of hammer bending to finish it off. Not ideal, but hey, we got it done. So from there, we need to make some triangles to close in the corners. So we used it as its own template, went ahead and cut the triangles out. We had to do a little bit of trimming. Now this was definitely a quick job on these triangles. We could have taken a lot more time and made them a lot more precise, but hey, if they fit close enough that we can weld the gap, that's really all that I need. So we get them in place on the workbench, throw a couple tacks on them. They're a little tricky to tack because they just barely fit. And if you ever tack small aluminum pieces, man, it's real easy to just shove it out of the way with the rod when you go to tack it. But we got them tacked. These actually welded out really nice, surprisingly. I, I don't know what it was, but especially the first one welded out real good. Came out looking nice. Um, but we got those welded up and the button box is done. All right, we got our box finished up. Uh, we just need to mount it in the car. Super basic little project, one of those things. I could have made it look really nice and spent a whole day or so on it, but I just wanted to whip something up in an hour or two, just get it done. We're at that stage of the build where we got to pick and choose our battles and what we want to make super nice. I'm just going to spray paint it black and it'll just blend and you won't see it. Uh, but one thing I thought of to do, this is our kill switch button essentially for the solid state battery isolator. And this is what we're going to use to turn the car on and off. So we'll click that. It'll send power to the PDM and then we can turn on, you know, our ECU, start the car, etc. Um, and then that will also be our in-car kill switch to kill power to everything. So having it all in the same spot, just click it on, boom, ignition, starter. We need to kill the car, boom, click it off right there, all within reach, fully strapped into the car. Should be pretty intuitive to get to, too. So I thought of that midway through, and it works out. So uh, yeah, let me get this mounted, and then we'll paint it, and then we'll mount it, mount it, and then move on to something else. All right, those are the ones I know for sure I want. Ignition, starter, headlights, wipers, interior lights slash wheel well lights, and then fan override to keep the fan and water pump running. Past that, I'm not sure what else we might want or need. I have thought about maybe making, trying to see if there's a way I can program between this and the Dominator to where this is boost up and this is boost down, right? So like every time I press this button, it bumps the boost up. Every time I press this button, it bumps the boost down. Uh, but we'll see. We can also just do a little knob. Uh, so we'll, we'll hold off. Let's not jump the gun on our last two spots. But those are for sure not going to change. I need all of these. Out 
All right, button pad is officially mounted. Really happy with that location. Like I said, this is gonna be our main power to the whole car. So just from right in the driver's seat, I can kill power to the whole car, completely disconnect the battery. So that'll be really nice. We'll probably set it up where I press that button. That gives power to the PDM. And then ignition, starter, boom, starts up. So we've got the right size wire for this. It could stand to be six inches longer, uh, but it's pretty close. We'll clamp it, it should be good to go. Uh, so happy with that, happy with that location. That all panned out well. Uh, so we also got the Holly Dominator mounted up. Like I said, we just need to get the right size brackets. I got those ordered. We can finalize that. We'll have to check it with the dash to make sure the angle's right and whatnot, but that's in place. The digital dash is in place. This is another mount we got from Motion Raceworks. Uh, so we might tinker with that a little bit, but overall, most of the electronics are mounted. The smart wire, the keypad, the dash, the ECU. Still need to mount the EGT controller. That's gonna send the EGT signals from each individual cylinder to the ECU, but I've got a couple ideas on how I wanna do that to make it a little more serviceable. Um, and we're waiting on a few things in the wiring department, a few things in the fitting department. Uh, we can dive back into all that, but I'm pretty happy to be at the point of lines and fittings. As I've said before, there are a couple of other things we need to do besides just the lines, fittings, and wiring, but we're getting there, man. We're on the home stretch, so I'm pumped. Uh, really happy with what we got done. Once we get those last few parts in, we should be able to hammer out a lot more projects. So I hope to see you guys for that. But for now, we are out of time. I'm gonna go ahead and end it here. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Goodbye.